Headscarves and hymens, why the Middle East needs a sexual revolution, is a feminist missive that calls for radical change, both at the individual and societal levels. Joining us again tonight to detail some of the changes she'd like to see, Simona El Tahawi, journalist and author of the aforementioned Headscarves and hymens. Welcome back. Let's just say it's not you that wants to see this. Other people want to see the changes that you're calling for as well um, in the Middle East. So just, just to lay that out there. But I want to, um, and we'll talk about the subtitle of your book in a sec. Um, but I want to talk about you for a bit. So you identify as a Muslim. You grew up wearing a hijab. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm assuming you did this, did that, because it was expected of you? Yeah, I mean, I, I say I chose to wear a headscarf, and I wore it for nine years, but it took me eight years to take it off. That's how I describe it. Why? Because I, you know, I realized that it was much easier to choose to wear a headscarf than it is to choose to take it off. You know this word choice? You know, we, we often wrestle with this notion and word of choice. And you know, I hear from a lot of young Muslim women who either like my work or don't like my work or want to get into a discussion. They always say, I chose this, I chose this. Well, I chose it too. I chose to wear a headscarf when I was, at first I wanted to wear it when I was 15, very soon after my family moved to Saudi Arabia, three weeks after we moved to Jeddah in Saudi Arabia. We went on Hajj, which is the fifth pillar of Islam. And you know, this is the holiest site for Muslims in Mecca. And during our Hajj, I was groped twice once by a man who was behind me doing the actual rites of, you know, when you circulate around the Kaaba, the mm. cubicle structure towards which Muslims pray. And another time by a Saudi police officer. And, you know, at the time I wasn't able to tell my parents what had happened. I was, I was first of all, shocked <laughs> and horrified that this was happening in the holiest site of my faith. And, and I was too ashamed to even put it into words. I was 15 years old. And I just found this kind of consistent pattern of street sexual harassment everywhere I, want, I went. So I just wanted to hide. So I thought, you know what, I'm just going to cover from head to toe. That's what they tell me that a good Muslim girl should do. So I will do it. And maybe it will just stop the men's eyes and hands. At 15, my parents told me, you're too young. Let's just wait for a bit. My mother had already began to wear a headscarf when she performed Hajj. Then I finally did it when I was 16 years old. And, and it wasn't just to hide from the men. It was also because I, I was falling into a deep depression because of my struggles with adapting to life in Saudi Arabia. And I say, I, made, I struck this deal with God. I was like, so listen, God, they tell me that, you know, good Muslim girls should cover their hair, so I will. And in return, save my mind, please, because I'm <laughs> losing my mind. And I joke again that God did not keep his side of the bargain because I fell into a deep depression. <laughs> did you, but did, you, did the hijab stop the harassment? I mean, you said part of his reason, I'll be a good Muslim, I'll wear this thing. Guys might stop groping me, did they? Well, you know, the, the first ever time in my life that I wore anything that resembled a hijab was during the rites of pilgrimage. So here I am for the first time, I look like a nun, basically, for those who don't know what hijab looks like, and I'm assuming everybody does. So I'm, everything is covered except for my hands and my face, and yet here's this man who groped me, and here's a, a Saudi police officer who groped me. So clearly it doesn't, and you know, surveys have consistently shown that regardless of what women wear, and we all know this to be true globally, regardless of what a woman wears, it does not quote unquote protect her from sexual violence or street sexual harassment. You uh, meet many interesting people when you live in Saudi Arabia. You write about one, you write about an anecdote, you meet a young guy in Jeddah in Saudi Arabia. Can you share that story with us? This is the gypsy car driver. Well, again, you know, very soon after we arrived in Saudi, I said, you know, my, my mother couldn't drive and my father had ordered a car, the family car, and it hadn't arrived yet, so we would have to take public transport. When we took the buses, now, and, and I'm gonna introduce it by take, you know, talking about the buses, you would take the, ver the few buses you had in Saudi, we would buy the ticket, and my mother and I would have to go to the back of the bus, which reminds you of, you know, pre-Civil War, mm. United States, the back of the bus. So every now and then we would take the gypsy cabs. And once we took this gypsy cab, and the guy, the driver was maybe 25 years old, at the time I was 15, and he dropped us off to the shopping mall so we could go buy our groceries. And it was before I began to wear hijab. And he insisted on waiting for us, which we thought was very kind. And then he's driving us home. And he turns to my father in the passenger seat and he says, uncle, I want to marry your daughter. My, at the, in the back of the, of, of the cab, my mother and my brother and I are trying very hard not to laugh. I'm 15. My, my, my dad says, you know, my son, she's 15 years old. And he says, I don't care. My father says, well, I do, because in my family, nobody gets married, boys or girls, until they finish university. So he says, I will wait for her. <laughs> and my dad spends the rest of the journey going home, trying to dissuade him from wanting to marry me. Now, you know, at first we laughed, but then I just thought, I'm 15 years old and he wants to marry me, despite the fact that my father told him she's 15, mm. which really shook me up. Where are you now? You're many years abandoned your hijab. 
What's your stance on this thing now? We talk about it. I shouldn't say this thing. It's a bit rude. But we, we discuss the hijab a lot in our country as well. Mm -hmm. You obviously don't wear it anymore. Yeah. What do you What do you think about the hijab? Well, the hijab and all forms of veiling play a very l large part in my life, not just for my own writing and my own thinking and my own history, but because my mother wears a headscarf, my sister wears a headscarf. And basically, when I look through family pictures, in the 1970s, before my family moved to the UK, we have dozens of pictures from family weddings where my aunts, you know, have their hair made up, they're dressed up in all these glitzy dresses that are even belly dancers in the weddings. And now, most of my aunts and most of my cousins are completely covered up. So clearly, this some pendulum has swung in Egypt, where the majority of women did not wear any kind of veil to the majority of women in Egypt now wearing a veil. And, and I, I constantly wrestle with this. What is it that is making women wear veils in such large, large numbers. And obviously women veil for different reasons. My mother w wears a veil because she believes it's a religious obligation. My sister wears a headscarf. She's doing a PhD at Northwestern University because she wants to be openly identifiable as a Muslim. I chose to take off my headscarf. But over the past two years in Egypt, I know at least 10 women who have removed their veil. And they have directly connected it to the revolution, which says to me that this pendulum is swinging back, which says to me that it was a combination of this rising conservatism in my country, at least Egypt, which is a, a great inspirer of the whole region. So we had the, the rising conservatism of the Muslim Brotherhood and political Islam that was met with a conservatism from nominally secular regimes, but which fought the political Islamic groups with their own version of conservatism. And who gets stuck in the middle? Mm. I, I call girls and women the cheapest bargaining chips. Whenever anyone, like I was talking yesterday about these arms deals that happen, and countries say, mind your own business about women. It's like, I imagine women and girls as these bargaining chips that are just thrown across the table and say, you know what, I'll give you two chips of women if you give me this in return. And I think this is what has happened mm. to girls and women, that the conservatism that suffocated us played out because our bodies are these canvases upon which this conservatism is drawn. I want to stick with your family for a second because you said something that's quite interesting. And I want to know if this is representative of most Egyptian families or Middle Eastern families, if, if you want to broaden it out to that context. And is that there are different reasons why women wear that. Let's stick with the hijab for right mm -hmm. now. Your mother had her own, mm -hmm. your sister had her own. But both of their reasons seem to be based on their choice, which is an argument mm -hmm. we always debate here yes. in Canada. She's wearing a hijab, but mm -hmm. it's her choice. Others yes. will say, well, no, she, she thinks she has free choice, but her right. father or brother or whoever right. else made them do it. Mm -hmm. Is this about choice? Well, that's why I say, you know, I chose to wear the headscarf, but it took me eight years to take it off because it's much easier to choose to wear it than to choose to take it off. A lot of these women who now have taken off their headscarf um, t tell me of how many years it took them to take it off. I hear from other young women who say, my family won't let me take off my headscarf. My mother threatens to lock me up at home. So this idea of choice is troubles me deeply. But I think, you know, underneath that wrestling with choice is this concept of modesty modesty culture. You know, we hear of the purity culture in the United States where girls sign, um, you know, vow to keep their virginity to their fathers and then they get married and all this. So modesty culture and purity culture, these are concepts that come up in very conservative communities and basically they, un they unfairly burden girls and women. So even when women tell me I've chosen to dress like this, this idea of modesty, that you are expected to be modest, this is an expectation that is never made of boys and men is an expectation that is made of girls and women. And so when I sit with girls and women who want to openly talk about this, I ask them, why are we not expecting boys and men to be modest? Why is it just us who pay this price? Mm. And where in that does choice fit? And I think that really complicates choice in the way it should be complicated. Let me add this uh, into our conversation, though, just as, a, as an anecdote, as, as maybe a parallel to, to introduce a new idea. It was this. When I lived um, in Israel, I knew a woman, an Orthodox uh, Jewish woman, who wore a wig. Mm -hmm. And in her 40s, she decided, I don't want to wear a wig anymore. Mm -hmm. And she took it off. She looked beautiful. She had beautiful mm -hmm. hair. And I said this to her, you look beautiful, blah, mm -hmm. blah. And she, you know, said, kind of rebuffed and said, I'm thinking about putting my wig back on. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, gosh, why? Have these, you know, mm -hmm. men, is your community not accepting? She said, no. She said, but when you live an entire life mm -hmm. wearing a wig and then you take it off, she said, it's about self-identity. She said, to me, she said, it would be the same thing, like you went and shaved your head suddenly mm -hmm. and you didn't feel like yourself. Mm -hmm. So a lot of women, if I can draw that parallel, would say, mm -hmm. Well, the head shop is what I know. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's not a big deal. Quit making it a big deal, Westerners. Mm. It's just what I do. Just... 
Um, I, I hear what you're saying because I lived in Jerusalem myself. Mm. I was a correspondent for Reuters there for about 13, 14 months. And when I would see, there were a lot of ultra-Orthodox Jewish families in my own neighborhood. And they reminded me of Saudi families, whether it was the purity culture by which they lived, uh, and purity and modesty culture, mm. because of wearing wigs, or family structure, or family hierarchy, all of that. The man walking way ahead of the woman, just in, in, in Jerusalem, in Jeddah, same mm. thing. But this idea that it's, it's how I identify, you know, again, I, I want to unpack that and I want to say, why is, is it okay and we don't wrestle with this idea that women must cover everything up in order to feel comfortable and feel that that's their identity? And, and I would also question this idea that it's an obsession of the West. As I said, you know, I've had many women share their experiences of unveiling in Egypt and other countries after the revolution. I, I think that we need to stop this Islam versus the West. Mm. I think it's, it's women who are sharing their own stories of their struggle with the veil, of their, their adventure path, whatever you want to call it. And I think that because it gets put into this frame of Islam versus the West, I would much rather remove that frame and say modesty cultures versus those of us who want women to be considered more than just modest. And that's why I would include ultra-Orthodox Jewish women, nuns, Christian women who are told to w be pure and be modest, and Muslim women who abide by modesty culture. That way, we don't have this reflexive Islam versus the West. That way, you recognize that a woman like me can be Western and Muslim, that a woman like my sister, who's doing a PhD in Northwestern, is Western and Muslim. And we end this false dichotomy of Islam versus the West that I think only arms the right wing and the left wing that, I, you know, yesterday I was telling you, doesn't help the debate. All right, let's um, take this to, to another situation because I think this is, um, well, I might suggest this is where really those differences between West and Islam really are stark. And this is the niqab mm -hmm. or the burqa, which are different but similar, and just mm -hmm. in case people are confused about what they are, the hijab is the, the head covering, you mm -hmm. see a woman's face, the niqab, you just see their eyes, mm -hmm. the burqa, you're completely covered. Yes. What are your thoughts on the niqab or face veil or burqa, if we throw that in there? Right, I, I absolutely oppose the covering of a woman's face. I find it um, a very dangerous and frightening erasure of a woman's identity for the sake of piety. And I also think that um, it pushes us into, again, these endless arguments and discussions about choice and a woman's right to choose when, first of all, this, this is a, a form of dress that is, when you go on pilgrimage, a woman is not supposed to cover her face which says to me that it is not an Islamic requirement. It's much more of a cultural kind of throwback to almost like pre-Islamic Arabia. So I don't consider it a religious obligation. And I think, again, it's one of those things that unfairly burden girls and women, because when you talk to several women who, who, who follow that, some of them will tell you that I was told when I was growing up that if you are especially attractive, it is your duty to cover your face. Why? You, because you have to control women's, um, men's ability to control themselves. So again, you know, I find it very, very offensive and very dangerous on many, many levels. But ultimately, it's this erasure of women for the sake of piety by a, an ideology, which is mostly Salafi Wahhabi ideology that, you know, largely resides in Saudi, an ideology that doesn't even believe in a woman's right to choose anything mm -hmm. but the right to choose to cover her face. So let's bring in this word ban. Do you think, and, and maybe you have to separate it by the Western world and the Islamic world, do you think the niqab should be banned? I'm not a fan of banning anything, but this is one thing I am a fan in, uh, of banning. But the reason that I want to ban the face veil is the same reason that the state of New York, where I lived for many years, uh, does not allow groups of three or more to cover their face. There are reasons that I believe, as human beings in a community, we need to see each other's faces. So uh, for the reason I mentioned earlier, this erasure of a woman's identity for the sake of, of uh, piety, I also think that we need to see each other's faces for nonverbal communication, for the sake of security and identity, for many other, other reasons. So the ban on the face veil is something that I actually do agree with. And when people come back with, it's not the government's role to tell me how to dress, I tell them, well, you know what, try leaving your house naked. The government does tell you how to dress all the time. How do you, and we're going to parse all of that, uh, but individually, how does Mona Al-Tahawi sort of square that contradiction for herself, which is this, you're, 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 you fight for liberal values um, and, and freedoms, and yet you're saying on this one issue, mm -hmm. I don't believe in freedom. I think sometimes, and it's difficult, you know, I said to you, I, I don't usually want to ban anything. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes as liberal societies, we end up taking illiberal measures for the greater good. 
And I think that this is one of them, because I honestly believe that if I was sitting here in front of you, Pia, with my face covered, our dynamic would be very different. This conversation would be very different. I wouldn't notice that you had just lifted your eyebrows, for example, <laughs> in surprise, you know? Mm. I think that we underestimate the value and importance of nonverbal non communication in this human contract that we have. And, you know, if a, when the government lifts the ban on my being able to be nude everywhere, I can, I can truly be challenged on being illiberal. But I think that, you know, if, if we are banning people from leaving their house naked, we are being illiberal. Why are we banning people from leaving their house naked? Why, for example, are we banning people from owning a slave if we believe in this, you know, unfettered freedom? Obviously, I oppose slavery and I don't want anyone to own slaves. But if someone came up to me and said, it is my right to be somebody's slave, why are you denying me this right? I would laugh. I would say to them, that is ludicrous. Of course, call me as illiberal as you want, but it is wrong to be someone's slave. Do you know what I mean? Mm. So there are things that we end up banning, even though we like to consider ourselves liberal. And when it comes to feminists, because I've often been told, what kind of a feminist are you? You won't allow a woman to choose this. I consider the face veil the antithesis of feminism. Feminism is about a woman's right to choose. But as I said, Salafi Wahhabi ideology, which underpins the face veil, doesn't believe in a woman's right to choose. Saudi Arabia, as I told you yesterday, treats a woman like a five-year-old child her entire life. And yet, in the same ideology, a woman has the right to cover her face. So I think we, we, we really need to sit down and be honest and talk about what kind of ideology we're dealing with here and who is really being illiberal. Because I'm, I'm being told to be tolerant of the intolerant. I like to think of myself as a very tolerant person, but if I'm going to allow an intolerant ideology to use feminism, to cut feminism at its knees, I'm going to put my foot down and say, you can call me whatever you want. This is not feminism and this is not freedom. Let me push back and use your analogy, one of your analogies, slavery. People would say, well, that's injury to a human being. The face fail, it's personal choice, it's not hurt hurting anyone. It's not hurting an individual. It's not hurting a broader swath of society. It's her and her family's choice. Leave it at that, Mona. I think there is an emotional damage that happens when we see women being erased like this, when we cannot even identify the person. I don't know who you are, not, not because I need to see your ID so you can go into a bank or if you violated a, a traffic law or whatever. You as a woman do not exist anymore. I, I don't know who you are anymore. I find this you know, on, on an emotional level, incredibly dangerous. And then, you know, there, there is a hierarchy that it creates for women. And I know this hierarchy very well in Egypt because I am now on the bottom end of this hierarchy. I used to wear a headscarf, right? So I was considered a good, pure woman. I have now tumbled down this hierarchy because <laughs> I'm not, no longer wearing a headscarf. So we, we've placed women where the purest is the one, the least of which I can see. And then a few kind of degrees down is the one who at least covers her hair. And then at the bottom of this, this woman with red hair and tattoos, are you kidding me? Now, when we talk about sexual violence generally here in the West, we never ever talk about it as a crime of sex and desire because it's not, it's, it's a crime of power. And, and it, it's men exercising power and entitlement over women. Unfortunately, when we unpack sexual violence and street sexual harassment, where I come from, Consistently, surveys have shown that people blame women for the way they dress. Often it's with rape, women are asked, what, what are you wearing here? But it's much more of an urgent issue in Egypt, for example, where I told you yesterday 99.3% of girls and women are subjected to street sexual harassment. Women and men, even women have internalized this. They say, it's because my hijab wasn't right. I was wearing the wrong kind of hijab. My clothes were too tight. And the men will say things like, well, you know, I saw her and she didn't look like a good girl, so it didn't matter that I groped her or harassed her. This hierarchy is dangerous. This hierarchy for me is dangerous. And underpinning this hierarchy is a modesty culture that lifts up to the top the erasure of women. And that's why I oppose the, the face veil. Um, we're gonna have to switch gears because I do wanna spend some time today, I promised it yesterday, because it's such a great thing to learn about. These Arab feminists that we've never, we, we can list off the name, we both in this, this time, but you name drop a lot, a lot in your <laughs> book when it comes to mm -hmm. feminists. Um, but I want to talk about the women um, in, in, in the Middle East and North Africa who inspired yeah. you. So introduce yes. me to a couple. Well, when I was 19 years old and I was in university in Saudi Arabia is, is really when I became a feminist because for some reason, I don't know who it was, some dissident professor, bless her and her feminism, had stocked this bookshelf full of feminist journals that were my first introduction 
to basically feminism from the region. So I got introduced to women like Hoda Sharawi, who was an Egyptian feminist who in, in the 1920s famously removed her veil and said this is a thing of the past and gave birth to modern feminism in the region. In the 1950s, an Egyptian feminist called Duraya Shafi, along with 1,500 women, stormed the Egyptian parliament to demand the right to vote. And then when it wasn't given, she, they went on hunger strike and eventually women got the vote thanks to them. Mm. In the 1970s, a, a, a feminist who's still with us called Nawal Saadawi in Egypt, who was one of the first and one of the few women who opens, openly talks about her genital cutting and how it has impacted her life. In Morocco, the feminist sociologist Fatima Mernisi. In Saudi Arabia, which makes a lot of people go, feminist in Saudi? In Saudi Arabia, where Jiha al Hawaydar, who I think is also a dual Canadian citizen, who for years has been violating the ban on driving and she had her passport confiscated and was banned from writing for the Saudi media, to Manal Sharif who was jailed for 10 days for daring to drive, to so many other feminists in the region, to the Moroccan human rights defender Khadija Riyadi who launched a campaign to decriminalize sex outside of marriage. Mm -hmm. So whether it's about sex and sexuality or women's right to drive or women's right to vote, all of these feminists are mine. They belong to my heritage. Mm. I take them all the way back to the first person to become a Muslim was Muhammad's wife, Khadija. She was 15 years older than him. She employed him. She was a divorcee and she proposed to him. And she was his only wife. He was 25, she was 40. She was his only wife until she died. Now, in my book, I ask again and again, what have we done to Khadija? What have we done in our practice of Islam and its marriage to our various cultures that has erased Khadija? Because when I look around... I'm going to be honest, I've never heard of this, this woman until course, reading your book. Of course, yeah. but this woman is my feminist godmother all the way back then. So when people say to me, why do you talk about feminism? It's a Western thing. Or you want the West to rescue them. I laugh and I say, I have a heritage rich with women upon whose shoulders I stood and was able to build my own feminism. And I hope that people who read my book recognize that I have all of these names who are my allies in this feminist revolution. I want to stick with uh, Khadija for a minute. Mm -hmm. Again, never heard her, you never hear about, about her. Mm -hmm. How would you characterize um, her percep the perception of her amongst many Muslims? Do they, do they just erase her? She's lost in a discussion of countries that have child marriage, which is a horrific crime committed against girls. Countries like Yemen, Sudan, and Saudi Arabia, where you have quite high levels, Egypt too, my own country, where child mar marriage is either allowed or happens secretly and nothing is done. And yet our clerics are silent about it because they think that they are upholding some prophetic tradition. My question is why are they not upholding the prophetic tradition of marrying a woman who is 15 years older than you, who is clearly not, not your equal, who is you know, much more powerful than you because she employed you. So if Muhammad could marry a woman who was richer and more powerful than him, why are our clerics not encouraging our young Muslim men who have, you know, very high levels of unemployment? Why are they not saying go out and marry women like Khadija? They're not. So even though we hold her in high esteem, our clerics, and this is the misogyny that I'm talking about, our clerics will go on and on about leave child marriage alone, we can't touch it, but they will not talk about marrying older women. So we should be criminalizing child marriage and encouraging our young men to follow the prophetic example and marry older women if, like Muhammad, they find one. You know, yesterday when we started talking, I said, you're, you're provocative. You would be provocative if you wrote a book about um, feminism and just talking about head scars. But you go on in your book, I mean, you are calling for this sexual revolution. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm, I'm guessing in, in many parts of the, of the Middle East, this is not a place where societally and in home life that people are sort of comfortable talking about. Is that, am I wrong on that? Is that a fair assessment? No, you're absolutely right. I mean, why do we have between the age of 15 to 49, 91% of Egyptian girls and women have had their genitals cut? for absolutely no reason but to control their sexuality. So yeah, sex is a big taboo. It is a, a very conservative culture pervade, you know, across the region. But the reason that I talk about sex, I mean, there are two reasons actually. One is, again, it's in our heritage, and this is something that we in the region and those outside the region have forgotten. I refer in my book to women poets from the 10th and 11th century who were very open in their discussion of desire and pleasure. And they, were, you know, they would write this poetry that was full of desire in the 10th and 11th century in Arabic. Why did we lose that? How did we lose that? We must bring that back. So it, it is again part of our heritage and it's not me mimicking the West. Mm. I'm saying this is mine and I want to bring it back. But the other reason that I want to bring it back is, is in Egypt at least, we have begun to talk 
so many women have begun to talk openly about street sexual harassment and sexual violence. After I was sexually assaulted in 2011, I spoke very openly about what happened to me. But 12 other women experienced almost identical sexual assault and, and, and physical assault. I had my arms broken as well. But they were silenced by their families or couldn't speak out because of a taboo. So now that more and more women are talking about sexual violence, I feel that we're making progress. But my worry is if we just talk about sexual violence, sexual, sex will always be associated with violence. Mm -hmm. And I want to move beyond that. And I believe that one of the ways that we can break this female genital mutilation and this need to cover women up and modesty culture is to claim our pleasure and claim our desire and claim our sexual power. Because ultimately, I think our revolutions, if they're to be true revolutions, they're about agency and consent. And that's what also lies at the heart of sex and power and desire. So I've, I've moved beyond just talking about what happened to me when I was sexually assaulted to saying, I demand pleasure. I deserve pleasure and it's my right to have good sex. Because I believe that the more we talk about this, we also end up talking about things that are left in the dark that just hurt girls and women. And that is sex outside of marriage. We never talk about this in the region, but it, it happens. And when it happens as a taboo, it will be dangerous and it will often end up being the most dangerous to the weakest elements of society who are girls and women. Thank you. I know you're gonna, you're, you've heard this word a lot about you um, and you'll hear, continue to hear it. But it's brave what you're doing, it's taking a stand. Thank you for joining us for the past couple of nights. Thank you, Pia. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.